Yes. So, and how many were on your team on the brief? So it was uh, Willie and me so, from Goodwin. And I'm not and represented. Had, uh, three people. But there from are three the district court council. Okay. So right. total. Okay. Um, I think yeah. that's great. So, do I have a name? You're over here. Right here. Okay, right in the center of the <laughs> Okay. I take this as a souvenir. You can, actually. <laughs> oh, kids, can I have one? <laughs> Some I need Mio to here to, to flavor <laughs> the water. <Yeah. laughs> what? The, the liquid water enhancer? <laughs> All right, so the webcast is about to start, so let's roll. Okay. <clears throat> so what is the format of the lighting? I'm going to set up the case, okay. and then um, I'm going to invite you to tell us about shuffling the First we'll do the yeah. merits, essentially, and then we'll talk about the argument okay. in, as a re second round. All right. That's so not the merits right and then the argument. The merits of the issue in the Supreme Court. Yes. yes. Okay. And sort of explaining. Sure. 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 All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome back to the Supreme Court series here at American University Washington College of Law. My name is Michael Carroll. I'm the director of the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property. Um, and we have a distinguished... A uh, set of uh, speakers here with us, uh, including Mr. Dabney next to me, who is down at the Supreme Court arguing earlier this morning. So thank you very much for making the time to join us. Happy to do it. And I am going to bring your illustrious bios up on my uh, <laughs> iPhone as we speak. Um, oops. Sorry. Oh. In, in, oh, so Jonas has them. Well, Jonah, my, my colleague Jonas Anderson, you want to introduce our speakers? Um, you, you can, now that you have. No, I got, it. I got it. All right. So James Dabney is the co-head of the Hughes, Hubbard, and Reed's Intellectual Property and Technology Practice. Um, he specializes in contentious matters involving patents and other forms of intellectual property uh, and a, a variety of technical fields. Um, he's also an adjunct professor at Cornell, where he teaches a course entitled Conflicts in Patent Law and Practice. Um, next to him is Brian Burgess, from a partner in the, um, <clears throat> in the Goodwin Proctor uh, Litigation Department and Appellate Litigation Practice. His work is primarily uh, appellate matters in complex civil litigation in federal courts, and he has experience in a wide range of areas including constitutional law, administrative law, patent law, antitrust, and financial services litigation. Um, and he clerked for Justice Sotomayor um, while, when she was on the Supreme Court, um, and prior to that he had clerked on the Seventh Circuit. To his left is our good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Megan LaBelle at the Catholic University of America, um, where she teaches and researches in the area of intellectual property and civil procedure. And this is a class, <laughs> a case about civil procedure and patent law. So uh, tailor-made for Professor LaBelle's interests. Um, prior to joining the Academy, she had worked for uh, a number of years as a commercial litigator in the Los Angeles firm of Munger, Tolls, and Olson. Uh, in which her practice was an intellectual property practice. Um, and next to her is my good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Jonas Anderson, uh, who is our patent law specialist on the faculty here at American University. Um, <clears throat> and um, he, prior to uh, joining our faculty, he spent a year working at uh, the Berkeley Law School as a fellow. And prior to that, he clerked for Judge Alan Lurie of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Uh, and he practiced in California as well um, at Latham and Watkins. Okay, so this is a case that involves sort of civil procedure as the source of law and patent policy as one of the reasons we have this case. For those of you in the room, you will see on the screens at the top, I hope, um, a, a statute that appears to answer, answer the question. Any civil action for patent infringement may be brought in the judicial district where the defendant resides or where the defendant has committed acts of infringement or and has a regular and established place of business. 
a fairly restrictive uh, scope for where the plaintiff may bring uh, the claim. However, a more general statute, Section 28 U.S.C. Section 1391, um, since 2011 has read that except as otherwise provided by law, and we'll come back to that, this section shall govern the venue, meaning the place where the lawsuit can be brought. Um, and it, uh, in analyzing that, an entity with the capacity to sue and be sued in its common name, corporations and other uh, forms of uh, sort of artificial legal entities, um, shall be deemed to reside um, in anywhere where the court has personal jurisdiction. And for those of you who've been through um, uh, constitutional law and civil procedure, you now know that that's uh, based on the specific personal jurisdiction is based on the level of activity that uh, the defendant has had with the forum state. So in general, in patent law, if you're making goods or services that are available throughout the United States, the chances are that the personal jurisdiction test is fairly easy to meet. Uh, why? So what? All my first year students in the room know that my favorite lawyer question is, so what? Who cares? Well, a lot of people care, and they care for a variety of reasons. But in particular, there's a lot of money at stake. If you look at the map of the United States and you look at the judicial districts in which patent litigation cases have been brought, um, you see that you get hundreds collected in a few districts where uh, there are local rules that are specialized for patent litigation. And then the, the Eastern District of Texas, and in particular the Marshall Texas Courthouse, receives a substantially larger amount of, of the litigation. Why is that? Because those rules tend to favor plaintiffs in a variety of ways that I expect we'll hear about more. Um, and therefore, they uh, attract a lot of patent litigation. And each one of those cases is worth significant sums of money, 10, 10 to hundreds of millions of dollars. So you start to do the math, and it's pretty quickly apparent that there are billions of dollars, theoretically, at stake if, if, if we were to reallocate where these disputes would be brought. And there would be some shift in the outcomes, say the, the parties and the litigants, and we're going to hear more about that. So the, but the legal question really is, it turns on the meaning of this word resides in section 1400B. Is that a word that should be read according to prior Supreme Court precedent, which would limit where a corporate defendant or a, a entity defendant um, uh, is deemed to reside? Or should the word resides be informed and supplemented <clears throat> by the definition of uh, residence in set in section 1391c2 um, and, and, and one has to read the otherwise provided by law to suggest that uh, it, it would still be complementary and not contradictory to rely on 1391. So in, in crux that's the statutory interpretation question. Those are the stakes and now we're off to the races. So Mr. Dabney you had uh, uh, you presented your uh, position before the court. How about sharing it with us a little bit more? Well, I think uh, uh, to understand this case, you have to know that um, the parties to it are business competitors that are based in the Midwest. Uh, the plaintiff is headquartered in Northfield, Illinois, and the defendant is headquartered in Carmel, Indiana. Uh, and the lawsuit was brought in the District of Delaware, uh, where there was no relevant development uh, activity undertaken on either side. The, the patented subject matter was developed elsewhere. The accused subject matter was developed elsewhere. Nothing uh, attracted the plaintiff to Delaware uh, in terms of what the case was about. Uh, so uh, because the defendant uh, was a relatively young company uh, based in uh, Indiana that had done everything right, it had you know, developed its own product, had its own brands, had its own patents, had its own process, had its minding its own business. Uh, 
Uh, it had no uh, no footprint in in Delaware. It had no no contracts in Delaware. It had no licensure in Delaware. I mean, Delaware was as far into it as as Alaska. Uh, when the lawsuit was brought in uh, in Delaware, uh, it presented a case uh, in which. Uh, uh, someone who teaches a course entitled Conflicts in Patent Law and Practice might have uh, had the, uh, uh, the fortitude uh, to make a motion that basically says the emperor has no clothes and that uh, uh, the Supreme Court's interpretation of Section 1400B actually is still the law. Uh, I say fortitude because uh, in 1990 the uh, Federal Circuit took the view uh, that the Supreme Court's interpretation of this statute that you have on your screen uh, was no longer valid uh, precedent and, and that uh, they were going to interpret the statute differently uh, than the Supreme Court had. And by and large, between 1990 uh, and, and, and 2014, when, when, we were, uh, when we were called to do this, uh, the lower courts, uh, so far as we know, uh, had, um, I mean, they had to follow the Federal Circuit's uh, authority, and they did. Uh, I'm not aware of, of any uh, efforts to try to seek uh, uh, overturning of the, of, the, of the Federal Circuit's precedent until our case. So when uh, we did that, we, we basically took the position that um, the reasoning of the Supreme Court's case interpreting 1400B um, remains valid that the uh, Federal Circuit's uh, rejection of the Supreme Court's interpretation of the statute was uh, uh, in excess of authority and um, that, uh, I mean, we, we, we preserved the issue for Supreme Court review, but in the, in the, in the trial court we were saying that uh, venue was improper also because there also was no personal jurisdiction over Heartland, which was the the only seeming way out of venue uh, under under Federal Circuit precedent at the time. Um, the uh, district court, of course, denied the motion. A uh, uh, petition for writ of mandamus was taken to the Federal Circuit for review, which is the standard uh, 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 appellate uh, process for seeking immediate review uh, of a venue ruling. I should say uh, that at least in New York, if uh, you don't at least make an attempt to seek review of, of an adverse venue ruling, you run the risk of waiving your venue defense if you continue uh, with discovery and trial procedures. It's, it's, a, risky, it's a risky strategy to, to just say, well, I'll try to get appellate review after trial. Uh, and the Federal Circuit in, uh, in April of, uh, of uh, 2016 uh, uh, dealt with the issue uh, in rather uh, you know, uh, uh, brief fashion. They took the view that uh, their precedent was valid, and they settled this question 25 years ago, and uh, that's their story, and they're sticking to it. Uh, and they did not seem to see any merit at all. In fact, the, the Federal Circuit used rather harsh language uh, in its opinion about the arguments that... Uh, and this is what I say, it takes a certain amount of fortitude to do this type of thing because um, uh, courts often don't mince words when you uh, make arguments that, that uh, challenge their, their precedent. Um, and then uh, we uh, petitioned the Supreme Court to review uh, this interlocutory order, uh, and the court granted cert. Uh, in December, and, and the question in the case basically was framed exactly as the court had uh, interpreted the law in 1957. Does uh, 1400B still constitute the sole and exclusive provision controlling venue in patent cases and is not to be supplemented by that other general <coughs> venue statute, 1391? Uh, and that case came before argument uh, this morning, and I don't know how much you want me to say further we'll, about we'll it. We'll come back the, into the that's argument. The, okay. that's, the, uh, that, that's how we got to where we are, and <coughs> Professor Carroll accurately <laughs> characterized what the, uh, statutory, uh, what the statutory issues are. But that's the backstory how we got to the Supreme Court. Okay. And the case is set for trial in October. <laughs> right. And just so we're clear that 
I mean, what we have is sort of two versions of a, a position that the question that the court's considering has been asked and answered. In your, your say the court, the question was answered in 1957. Correct. Okay. Mr. Burgess, you'd take a different view, that there's a different source of an answer. Tell us sure, about that. Sure. We think Congress supplied the answer when it passed a statute that defined the meaning of residence. Oops. Sorry about that. Go ahead. <laughs> For all venue purposes. Um, you know, in our view, the case turns on a pretty simple textual syllogism. We, no one doubts that the patent venue rule applies. There are many specialized venue statutes that apply in different situations. This is a patent infringement case, so 1400B is the provision that determines the venue rule. So you look and see, well, what supplies venue under 1400B? One situation is if it's a principal place of business and infringement. Another is if the defendant resides there. 1400B does not define resides. Where would we look to find that? In, in a general provision, 1391C, that defines venue, that defines residence for all venue purposes, runs through the, comprehensively the meaning of residence for corporations, corporate defendants, corporate plaintiffs, uh, LLCs, or you know various unincorporated associations, individuals. So we think that is clearly defining what it means, you know, what, what residence is for venue purposes. If you had any doubt whether 1400B is a venue statute, whether this would qualify as a, a venue purpose or whether it's accepted for some reason, Congress also took the trouble in 2011 to define venue. In 1390A, we have a clear definition of venue, which no one, I don't think, disputes encompasses 1400B. There are some exclusions in 1390 for admiralty cases, for example, but they didn't exclude patent cases. And so I think I really don't think there's any doubt that if this text were presented without the gloss, the historical gloss of Forco, that this would be a super easy case. The, the, the text just, it, the whole thing, there is a term that is undefined in the provision, and then we have a definitional section that supplies the definition. So the question is, because, because the fact that the Supreme Court interpreted an earlier version of the statute in the 1950s in Forco, does that change the result somehow? Did did the court say that for, you know for going f forward under even notwithstanding revisions to the statute the j 1391 can never apply to 1400 <laughs> that it is it is an island in, of itself regardless of the ways in which congress sort of deals with it and then there is also the the issue which came up in argument we can sort of get in more into the merits of whether the accept is otherwise by law clause is doing does significant work. One, one thing we would note in that, it, you know, there's a few different versions of the statute that's sort of worth keeping track of. There's the version that was in place at the time of Forco. Then the statute was amended in 1988, and then that was the provision that was before the Federal Circuit in the VE Holdings case in 1990. <clears throat> Interestingly, the except as otherwise by law language was not in 1391C at that point. So I'm not sure if you think that is doing the work, it's maybe you think V Holdings is right and then things went the other way, which is sort of an interesting view. Um, but it, at that point, Congress changed the law from what it had been, the statute, what it had been at the time of Forco to make clear that for the definition of residence should be anything <coughs> within this chapter. And the uh, venue statute is something that is included in the relevant chapter. Congress then, in, in 2011, act, enacted something called the Venue Clarification Act, which you might think was designed to clarify venue and provide sort of a comprehensive definition that would sort of be cross-cutting. And it was a, a project that was sort of a decade in the making, working with the American Law Institute and the Federal <laughs> Judiciary Conference that was focused not specifically on patent venue necessarily, but wanted to resolve several questions that had sort of troubled the lower courts that they had divided on about what is the residence for individuals? How do we deal with unincorporated associations? What about aliens? Do we want to continue to have a rule that they are entitled to no venue privilege, or do we want to adjust that such that it'll turn on residency rather than pure alienage? And they, what they did was they adopted a cross-cutting definition in 1391C that we believe by its clear terms applies to all venue statutes, not, not all venue statutes except for the patent venue statute. They didn't, that's not the statute they wrote. <laughs> um, so the, the question is, 
was Congress obliged to do more than that because four coexisted? You know, was were they required to like pat their tummy and pat their head, saying we actually want to change the law? That's and we think no, that the court, when Congress amends law and changes language, the court's precedent provides that we're going to look at that language on its own and give it its clear meaning. We don't require a special <coughs> clear statement any time that Congress wants to deviate from our prior interpretation of an earlier statute. So that's, in a nutshell, that's sort of our general approach to the issue. And w one thing I'll say sort of in the, in the initial framing, it, you know, it's sort of interesting talking about Del you know, it being strange to sue in Delaware. But the general rule in civil litigation, and this is something Professor LaBelle has is, is written about, it is that corporations are subject to venue wherever they're subject to personal jurisdiction. So this is a case sort of unusually where the argument is that the federal circuit erred by not treating patent law differently. It, by sort of harmonizing it with the general rules for civil procedure, that was the problem. And it's sort of ironic given that often the critique of the federal circuit is that it's trying to make patent law a body of its own that is not harmonized with the general law. Whereas here, the definition, our understanding of what Congress did brings patent law more into keeping with how venue is applied for corporations, for unincorporated associations across the board. All right, I'm going to turn it over to you guys, but just so we're keeping scare, score, right, the... Uh, there's always been a version of a patent venue statute for a very long time. There's been a general venue statute. An earlier version interpreted by the Supreme Court in 1957 holds that the prior version of 1400B is the exclusive source of jur jurisdiction in a patent case. 1988 comes along, Congress changes 1391. The Federal Circuit treats that change as being a meaningful change in the law and its VE holdings says from now on residence is defined by personal jurisdiction uh, the then we get the 2011 amendment which is the text you see now um, and the Supreme and the Federal Circuit said in the lower court in this case we're sticking with our under interpretation from the VE holdings and on review is the question of whether the 1957 Supreme Court precedent is the source of uh, is still the law because 1400B stays as a separate uh, revision or whether one or both of these revisions by Congress change the law. That's what's up for grabs. So, Professor LaBelle, help us bring the len lens back a little bit more. It's try to situate this within the broader sort of framework of civil litigation and, and venue provisions. Sure. So, um, well, are these on? Yeah. They're on. Okay. So... <laughs> Um, as uh, as has has been mentioned already, I mean the the Supreme Court often criticizes the Federal Circuit for um, uh, treating patent cases exceptionally and for creating special rules for patent cases. But um, the argument that that um, I have made and the others have made is that this is not the case here. This is one case where um, the Federal Circuit is actually treating patent cases just like other federal civil litigation. So. Um, all you students in the room, I am sure, um, have taken civil procedure. You've all studied venue, and you've studied 1391C, right? 28 U.S.C. Section 1391C, and you know that venue is proper um, where under 1391B, that's the general venue statute we've all been talking about, venue is proper where a defendant resides. If all defendants reside in the same state, I'm summarizing, but something, something to that effect. Um, but then the question is, okay, well, where does a corporation reside, right? Or where does, a, uh, uh, not just corporations now, but um, other uh, unincorporated associations. And then you look to 1391C, which defines where corporations and other um, entities reside. And they reside in districts where the defendant is subject to personal jurisdiction for this lawsuit. So that doesn't mean anywhere the defendant is subject to personal jurisdiction, but it's personal jurisdiction for this lawsuit. So, um, so in this case, in Forco, one thing that I don't think has been mentioned specifically yet that I would like to make sure um, we talk about is um, when the Supreme Court interpreted uh, 1391C in Forco, so that was in 1957, and they were interpreting um, the 1948 version 
of 1391C, it looked very different than it does now because at the time, 1391C was not just, um, it didn't just provide a definition of residence like it does now. Instead, it also was a substantive provision. So in other words, it um, set out where a uh, venue was proper for corporations and provided a definition for residents. So um, at the time it, the Supreme Court decided Forco, it was sort of faced with these two conflicting um, venue provisions. You had the specialized venue provision in 1400B, and then you had this generalized provision in 1391C. Um, but in 1988, Congress changed that. So, so first Congress changed it and made 1391C purely definitional, and I think this is very important. Um, and I urge anyone who's interested in this case to actually go and read the VE Holdings case because the Federal Circuit, um, in my opinion, <laughs> did a very careful job in that case um, considering FORCO, considering, considering the language of the previous statute, considering the language of the 1988 amendments, and took note that, that Congress changed 1391C and you no longer had this conflict between a specialized venue statute and um, uh, the generalized venue statute. Instead, you now had a specialized venue statute in 1400B and everyone um, agrees that that applies in patent infringement actions. And then you had a definition that was provided in 1391C. So, um, uh, so from, I guess, to get back to the initial question, just about um, looking at this from sort of uh, uh, in the bigger picture of civil litigation, um, venue in patent cases is no different than venue in all other federal civil litigation. Corporations can be sued where they are subject to personal jurisdiction. And Congress um, made this choice and made this choice that essentially where corporations are operating, where they have sufficient minimum contacts, they should be they they are subject to personal jurisdiction and therefore venue is proper. Um, and uh, there's no indication that um, Congress intended to treat uh, patent cases differently, right? Why should, I guess my question is, why should uh, corporations in patent suits um, uh, be protected more than corporations in other types of suits? Um, that doesn't mean that what's going on in the Eastern District of Texas um, is, is okay, um, but in my opinion, um, it's a problem to be addressed uh, by Congress or through through other avenues, because um, it's as uh, Mr. J said in an argument today, it's it's not a venue problem that people are really complaining about in terms of what's happening in East Texas, but instead um, uh, the procedures that are used in East Texas, some of the results in East Texas, some of the practices um, that, uh, in my opinion, have nothing to do with venue. Great, and I, I forgot to disclose so. Professor LaBelle is on a professor's brief that's favoring the respondent. Professor Anderson and I both signed a, an amicus brief that uh, favors petitioner. Uh, I'm here as the neutral moderator, so forget <laughs> the fact that I s signed that uh, brief, but Professor Anderson doesn't. Um, and um, so it's interesting that this is a, a suit between two operating companies where the venue that was chosen was the District of Delaware, which is is considered a relatively non-controversial uh, uh, site for patent litigation. Um, but we keep hearing about Marshall in the Eastern District of Texas, uh, and Professor Anderson, you've written about, both Both professors have written on this topic. This is deeply interesting to both of them. So Professor Anderson, maybe switch us now to the patent policy stakes that are going on. Why are there so many friends of the court trying to friendly, <laughs> be friendly, uh, pull them to one side. What's it, why do they care so much about Marshall, Texas? Yeah, so um, I'll do that. Let me start with an anecdote at the court today. So I was in the Supreme Court bar, which sits uh, uh, in front of the bar and sits right behind the, the litigants. And after the argument was over, uh, behind me, Daryl Issa was in the uh, audience. If, 
For those of you that don't know, he's a representative from California. He's the uh, uh, subcommittee chair for IP uh, of the uh, Judiciary Committee. Um, and so he was there because he has an interest in this case. Uh, it's not really, he doesn't care about 1,400, or he, he might. Um, he's a patent owner, right? Yeah, <laughs> he's got like 50 patents, yeah, I think. Okay. Um, so he might, he might actually care about that. But I think he cares more about uh, the thing Mike uh, referred to, which is uh, the Eastern District of Texas phenomenon. Um, and so there's been such a, a growth in the Eastern District of Texas that patent owners go to Eastern District uh, above and beyond all other courts. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, part of the venue expansion in the AIA increases that number so it looks bigger than it really is. Um, but what can't be denied is that Texas is extremely popular with plaintiffs. Um, and so um, my position, which is different than uh, uh, Megan's, um, I don't really care about civil procedure as much as, as the patent policy. Um, and, and, and as a patent policy matter, I think having a third of cases uh, basically tried before one judge, uh, Judge Rodney Gilstrap of Texas, um, is not good for patent policy. Um, and so we can debate about uh, whether it's Congress's job or the, what the, the courts can fix this. Um, I'm kind of ambivalent to who does it. Um, I really think that someone needs to do it, though, because we've had uh, a number of years where Texas has grown and grown as a, as a destination for patent plaintiffs. And um, th that's, I think, for reasons that aren't good for the patent system. The reason plaintiffs like Texas is because uh, they get a lot of procedural advantages in Texas. They get to choose their judge, essentially, um, and a number of other things that plaintiffs like a lot. And so um, I think... That can be solved one way is by <laughs> reducing the venue choices that plaintiffs have uh, in patent cases. Um, so um, I think we'll I'll stop there um, and we can continue this discussion. And, and we should note that Congress has considered a bill that would have uh, essentially addressed this through legislation, uh, <clears throat> whether that's here or there. But speaking of the court, um, and uh, Mr. I'm looking at the transcript, which w came out later than usual, so I haven't had a chance to read the entire thing. Um, but you'll uh, you'll notice that Mr. Dabney gets uh, a paragraph and a half out before the first question is in. So that's a fairly hot bench when you haven't even gotten to introduce. Um, that's more your, than you usually get. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so wh what were your impressions of the way the justices were frank looking at the case and ha how do you feel like the discussion went? Well, um, uh, it was, you know, some of the justices... Uh, uh, by their questions, uh, seem to be um, uh, asking questions you'd like to hear them ask. Uh, um, the the the, um, uh, the way that the petitioner framed the issue is is one that uh, the court basically was faced with the choice of deciding whether to uphold. Uh, or to destroy the venue protection uh, that uh, the Congress had prescribed in 1400B and the court's interpretation had declared. Uh, and framed that way, it's, it's, it's a, a matter of, of stability of the court's own precedent and, and what must uh, Congress do uh, if what it intends to do is to abrogate uh, a long settled precedent construing a statutory text that has not changed at all. Uh, so um, uh, my, my, uh, my feeling listening to the argument is that um, uh, you know there are uh, quite a number of justices who are concerned that their precedent um, uh, has not been uh, given uh, adequate respect. Uh, and I think Chief Justice Roberts is especially concerned about, I think he was the one who mentioned a quarter of the cases of patent cases are on the docket of a single judge. Uh, uh, and I think that that statistic, by the way, shows that um, I, I obviously don't agree with Professor LaBelle on this. I think that patent cases, uh, the, the claims for patent infringement uh, have characteristics which 
require a law like 1400B. It's, it's, it's really not, I think, an accident that there is a special uh, venue statute for patent cases and, and there is no such statute for uh, train wreck cases. It, it's a, uh, uh, it is a fact uh, that, um, uh, as experience has shown, uh, that claims for alleged patent infringement uh, lend themselves uh, to the type of uh, asportation, shall we say. They, they can move around and be bought and sold and packaged and, and used uh, to support rent-seeking behavior that, uh, that really is uh, uh, unique in that it is completely detached from any physical reality that uh, there's no there's no there's no tangible loss there's uh, the the claim doesn't have to be where anybody actually is and in fact uh, patent litigation is almost unique in that uh, until you get to the end of the case you don't know whether there was any injury at all because there might not have been infringement or the patent might be valid and, and there might be no obligation to pay anything so what a, what a claim for alleged patent infringement allows a plaintiff to do is to expose a defendant uh, to the prospect of paying hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, in order to prove that it doesn't owe anything. Uh, uh, so uh, I was uh, the most surprising part of the argument uh, for me uh, was when, on his own, Justice Breyer. Uh, voiced the view that he, you know, he sees all this talk about suits in Texas and what is that to me? It, 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 uh, he, he seemed to think that the, uh, the geographic distribution of patent litigation in the United States was something that uh, did not really bear on the issue before the court. Uh, and the response that I gave to that was uh, the... Um, what, what that shows is the importance of enforcing 1400B because everyone agrees that whatever may be the actual motives for patent plaintiffs to concentrate in this district or, or that district, uh, at least for relatively small and medium-sized businesses uh, like Heartland is, uh, they couldn't do it uh, if they had to adhere to the law of venue that the, the Supreme Court, had, uh, uh, held in Forco. Um, so, so those are just some impressions. Okay. And Mr. Burgess. Sure. I mean, uh, off the bat, there's one thing we'll agree about. That was an unusual question from Justice Breyer, <laughs> an unusual approach. Um, he's, he's usually someone that is quite interested in the practical policy implications. And he sort of said, let's take that off the table. I want to focus on what the statute actually says. Yeah. So that, that was sort of, that was interesting. I think it's, it, it tends to be a dangerous game to try to engage in tea leaf reading. Um, and so I, I mostly won't do it. We, we had a case, another case er, argued earlier this term involving uh, copyright of cheerleader, of designs on cheerleading uniforms uh, for varsity brands. And we were convinced that the chief was against us. He, everything he said was against our position. You know, sometimes he'll ask hard questions to both sides, but he just killed us. And then he voted with us this past week. So I think it, it's very difficult to tell. But there were a few things that I, th I found interesting. One was the, the Justice Breyer approach. Another, um, I think, sort of consistent with uh, what uh, Professor LaBelle was talking about. Justice Ginsburg had a lot. She is sort of a civil procedure person and comes from that background. And I think that showed she had a lot of questions about why is patent venue different? Can you come up with any other sorts of statutes where venue is, is restricted in this way, that residence has this sort of narrow meaning? So if we thought that was interesting. I don't think it necessarily forecasts her vote, but it, it showed the sort of angle that she was coming at it from uh, a civil procedure perspective rather than a patent law perspective. Um, another sort of thing that, that we found useful was sort of the way in which the 2011 Act, in our view, was, was very helpful because it clarified a lot of outstanding questions in the law, such as how to deal with unincorporated associations, which uh, T.C. Heartland is. Forco involved a corporation up until that point. You know, LLCs are a fairly new invention in the law. They you know, only sort of came into, into being in, in their modern form in, in the 1970s. So the question of how do we say that a, the, a 1950 Supreme Court decision interpreting an 1897 statute provided about how to handle LLCs. Petitioner has answers to it, so I don't want to suggest they didn't, but we, we thought it was is useful that 
our position is, well, Congress answered that, and you, rather than sort of engaging in those sort of difficult inquiries about figuring out what the common law means about LLCs, you can just supply the definition that um, Congress created. And so a few justices were sort of interested in, in that question, I thought. Um, and a few were totally quiet, so we have no idea what Justice Alito thinks about this case. He was very interested in how uh, ERISA applies to church plans in the, in the case before us and had nothing to say about patent venue. So, and uh, you know, Justice Thomas was, was at silent as usual, so you know, who, who knows. But. And, and I'm, uh, I'm just, uh, before we let Professor LaBelle in, I, I mean, Justice Kennedy has been the most worried about the patent trolls, the patent assertion entities. So one would have expected that to be on his mind. What, did he engage? I mean, he asked the question of, you know, seems like there are, or, and arguments have been made that there are significant jury verdicts in the Eastern District of Texas, and this is what it's attracting patent plaintiffs. Is that some? Is that relevant? How should I yeah, think he, about he that? He was questioning whether we, he should even care about Eastern District of Texas, because this was about Delaware. Right. <laughs> right. And so, this is about Delaware, and this is, I'm interpreting a statute. So, you know, yeah. to what extent is are those sort of considerations germane? Uh, he, he asked that. But there weren't, uh, in comparison to, I think, a lot of other and maybe it's because it was it's a procedural case rather than about substantive patent law. There was there was less of that sort of concern about trolls from the bench than I've seen in recent cases. Interesting. And Professor Labell, what do you think? <laughs> well, um, I w I was at the argument this morning, um, and uh, it was the quietest argument I've ever been to. So I was surprised at how few questions there were. Um, Again, I don't want to make predictions about um, justices, but um, I, I thought, okay, you can make the predictions. <laughs> I, I thought um, that the Chief Justice asked um, Crafts some of the hardest questions and um, seemed most concerned about the policy more than any of the other justices, in my opinion. I think, um, I also think the uh, argument at the end, um, uh, Mr. J. Uh, Crafts Council made a point about the potential impact on other types of cases, Hatch-Waxman cases in particular, um, and what the fallout might be, and that seemed to um, uh, get the justice's attention. I think um, uh, Justice Sotomayor asked a follow-up question about um, Hatch-Waxman cases, and um, you know, how a decision like this might impact venue and other types of cases. And that is something I hope that the justice will, justices will think about. And that's something that um, I've been hearing a lot of from the proceduralists. Um, how might this impact admiralty cases? How might this impact other types of cases with special venue provisions where courts have read 1391C's definition into those specialized venue provisions. Does that mean, you know, would TC Heartland wipe out all of those decisions and now courts have to figure out what resides means in all those specialized venue provisions? So um, I agree about Justice Ginsburg. She seemed to focus um, on, on, um, on the procedural aspects. And then um, Justice Kagan asked Mr. Dabney an interesting question at the beginning. I thought about um, basically how explicit does Congress have to be um, to overrule our decision in Forco. Um, I think um, Professor Anderson and I may take a different view on Justice Kagan um, here. I, I, I thought um, her question seemed, um, you know, she was asking some probing questions, and I, 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 I think maybe she's... Um, still on the fence, but, but Jonas but I, may have a different view there. I want to ask there. your opinion about that. And for the students, to me, this is a fascinating, uh, like there, all the different versions of statutory interpretation arguments get made in this context because of the dialogue between the courts and the Congress. And one of the general principles is that if Congress is aware of court precedent interpreting a statute and they then change the statute, it is thought that they're doing it with the court precedent in mind. But the problem is, which court precedent? Is it its own, the Supreme Court Forco case, or is it the Federal Circuit's VE Holdings case? And 
Justice Kagan f frames her question by saying, basically, well, the Federal Circuit basically ignored us for 30 years, so isn't it fair to say in 2011 that the Congress was essentially listening to the Federal Circuit's ignoring of our precedent? And that was her framing of the way to think about this dialogue. So is yeah. she saying that VE Holdings actually was you know, ignoring our precedent, but so what? We got to be practical about. So we'd had a conversation about this beforehand, and I went back to read it, and that is what she said. I, I'm not sure that's what she meant. I mean, or if she meant if the federal circuit was ignoring our precedent, should we assume that Congress is then legislating against the you know backdrop of the e holdings? Um, I also thought Justice Breyer asked a question on that that I thought was important about. Um, uh, you know, what, what if anything did Congress say in 2011 when it amended 1391 about the holding? And um, uh, the ALI work is very clear that the uh, ALI work, which was the basis for the amendments in 2011, the ALI report makes very clear that um, uh, that they that they approved of there was an approval of what the federal circuit did in the holdings and said I think the word was a partial palliative, palliative yeah. that it was sort of V holdings is helping the problem it wasn't that the federal circuit you know was um, uh, just ignoring you know the Supreme Court's decision in in Forco and Justice Breyer I watched his reaction to to, to that response and he did seem to um, uh, uh, sort of nod his head and um, think that was a helpful response so um but I, I don't know how to interpret justice kagan's question um she did say that whether she meant it i don't know <laughs> <laughs> right. and professor anderson what do you think <laughs> um it was really interesting today because there were uh, a lot of statutory heavy statutory arguments but on the side there was a lot of policy arguments about a court that's not even involved in this case and so the one way to think about this case is the more they were focused on the Eastern District of Texas, the more it favors the petitioner. And the more they're focused on the civil procedure, the, the statute in the case, the more it favors respondent. Um, and so if you, if you go by that, which is my theory, um, Justice Kagan and Justice Roberts, I think, were the most interested in Texas. Uh, they asked the most questions about Texas or <coughs> Forco. They gave you the impression that they were kind of... For petitioner, again, it's hard to to, to read into this. Um, and then on the other side, I was surprised by Justice Breyer and Justice Kennedy were not interested in Texas at all. And so that that kind of cuts both ways um, and says that well, if they're interested in what's actually going on in the statute, not in Texas, then we might get a different case than if it comes out the other way. There were a lot of assigned justices: Justice Alito, Justice Thomas, um, Justice Kennedy wasn't. Didn't ask many questions. Just that Breyer was actually pretty, I mean, for him. <laughs> um, so, uh, and Justice Sotomayor was uh, asked questions at the start, at the end, but in the middle she was largely silent. So it's tough to read this case more than more than most, I think. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think the more that um, East Texas influences the justice, they want, they want to take some bite at Eastern Texas, but I think this is a weird case for doing that. And so I'm not sure they're going to, Take the bite. Take the invitation to take a bite of Texas here. Interesting. <clears throat> Let me get, offer the chance for people in the audience to ask our panelists uh, questions if they have any. Where is this um, TC Heartland LLC Incorporated? Indiana. Do you? What contacts to Delaware do you have? None. Well, they distribute their infringing <laughs> products in well, the state of Delaware. They, they, um, the Washington Legal Foundation filed an amicus curiae brief because they felt uh, that this case was on the absolute outer bounds of uh, the Supreme Court's recent personal jurisdiction precedent. The, the situation is that one of Heartland's customers uh, is a big national retailer that has stores all over the country. Uh, and the contract uh, is between Heartland and Indiana and this big customer out in the middle of the country. And the company issues purchase orders from time to time with shipping instructions. And so, you know, Heartland will make up product in Indianapolis and drop ship it per the customer's instructions 
to uh, destinations. Sometimes the shipping destination is in, in Delaware, but it's uh, the, the shipments into Delaware are, are by common carrier and, and the buyer even pays the freight in, in some cases. And so if you're, uh, if, if traditional notions of fair play and substantial justice, whatever that means, uh, that, uh, that, that, is, that is contended by some to be a more uh, administrable standard than regular and established place of business, you know, <laughs> traditional notions of fair play and substantial justice, um, uh, reasonable minds could say that uh, fulfilling a purchase order in those circumstances uh, uh, it, it does not comport with the traditional notions of fair play and substantial justice that they should have to answer a, a nationwide patent suit in Delaware. But what if uh, you made the argument that, uh, say, you take a company like Amazon yeah. that ships everywhere? Yeah. So if, if you're not subject to venue in Delaware because you ship into Delaware, where would Amazon be subject to venue for patent infringement? Well, in interestingly, Amazon, uh, I, I, I have it, uh, I, I am told that uh, Amazon uh, has uh, probably uh, among the most numerous uh, logistics facilities uh, uh, around the country. Uh, they don't advertise, but I think you'll find that Amazon has regular and established places of business uh, all throughout the United States. But I also have reason to believe that the one place where Amazon.com does not have a logistics facility of any kind is, guess where? E.D. Texas. Yep, Marshall. <laughs> Probably a coincidence. <laughs> and I've heard tell of other companies who regret having set up shop on the wrong side of the street in Plano, Texas, because part of it's in the Eastern District and part of it's in another district. So, uh, can, can I follow up on that? Uh, I, I think um, this raises a really good question about personal jurisdiction here, because um, Mr. Dabney made some comments earlier about form shopping and patent cases, and that patent cases are a bit different. And um, I think what might be different is, and what maybe needs to be addressed is personal jurisdiction in patent cases, not venue. So that the problem is not venue, but if there's a problem, and I'm not saying there is, if there's a problem, it's personal jurisdiction. And the way the personal jurisdiction um, statute, ha or way the way personal jurisdiction has been interpreted in patent cases, because it is easy to establish specific jurisdiction. So again, going back to civil procedure, um, in a typical patent infringement action, um, you have a patent owner who can sue just about anywhere, because all they have to prove is that the defendant has contacts, um, uh, and those contacts are purposeful. Those contacts um, uh, gave rise to the lawsuit and that the exercise of jurisdiction is fair, right? Those are the basis for specific jurisdiction. So what are those contacts? You sell the accused product, right? So if you sell the accused product nationwide, you sell it anywhere, including the Eastern District of Texas. That's purposeful because you purposely decided to sell there. And um, uh, obviously the sale of that accused infringing product gave rise to the patent infringement action. That's the way... Um, uh, uh, the Federal Circuit has um, interpreted um, uh, in the Beverly Hills fan case, has interpreted the personal jurisdiction doctrine. It allows for personal jurisdiction to lie in virtually um, uh, I I any district if you're selling nationwide. And um, if there's a problem to be addressed by the court, in my opinion, perhaps <laughs> it's through personal jurisdiction. And um, uh, uh, coincidentally, or uh, the Supreme Court has taken a case this term, the Bristol Myers Squibb case on personal jurisdiction, um, which may uh, help to, to to address this issue. So, um, to me, it's not a venue problem. It's, um, if anything, a personal jurisdiction problem. Interesting. Other questions, sir. So, I have a question for Professor Hans. Um Your argument is more on the line of policy, practical implications. Now moving it, moving venue out of Eastern District of Texas, we will be putting it into the District of Delaware in the Northern District of California. Yeah. The District of Delaware, I think they have like probably like four active judges right now. Mm -hmm. so probably is gonna retire. That's, <laughs> that's, that's yeah. So so one one argument that I really liked from a respondent was at the very end. He said. Um, uh, basically, if you take, uh, you have one option. You can either leave uh, venue as it is, or you can 
change it and say, no, it's only re it's just restricted to uh, the place of incorporation. And those are really the two options. And he said, Congress has a lot more options and they are, they are, they can make uh, a more uh, precise um, cut about what we want to do with, with uh, venue. I agree with that. So um, if we want to do that, it, that would be great. Um, but um, I, I, I also think something needs to be done either by cor the courts or by Congress. And I don't really, I have no, I'm kind of an agnostic about who does it. Um, I'm just, uh, if, if we have the, the rule that says, you have to sue the, uh, the defendant where they're incorporated. We'll have a ton more cases in Delaware. Um, and uh, that would probably overwhelm them. Um, but uh, in the long run, Delaware is a better place for uh, patent policy to happen than East Texas. Other questions? All right. Well, with that, I have one, one more. One more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Professor LaBelle, you had talked about the implications this would have for other areas of law, like Hatch-Waxman, that was discussed briefly. Could you explain what that would be? So um, so in terms of Hatch-Waxman, um, there was a uh, the argument that was made, um, and Mr. Burgess might step in here sure. too, um, is that under the American Vents Act, you cannot um, join multiple defendants in a single patent suit for various reasons. Um, but uh, there's an exception for, to that for Hatch-Waxman cases. But um, uh, if venue was so limited, then you couldn't sue all these defendants. So in Hatch-Waxman cases, you have a branded pharmaceutical company suing um, you know, all the generics who uh, uh, manufacture that drug. And it's convenient um, and efficient to sue them in one venue. Um, but um, under the TC Heartland rule, that might not be possible because um, you can only sue each defendant uh, where the defendant um, uh, is is incorporated. So um, that was one problem. But there have been other potential problems raised um, because uh, I haven't looked at, there are hundreds of actually specialized venue, venue statutes. So in 2011, when Congress um, amended 1391, you know, there was, the, the ALI's sort of preferred course of action would have been to sort of get rid of all the specialized venue statutes, but that would be, you know, a huge task, too difficult. So um, uh, they, they took this this um, sort of simpler path of defining um, uh, residence and setting out other um, definitions that apply to all, all venue provisions. Um, but uh, questions have been, have been raised not necessarily in briefs, but people have talked about, you know, what, what impact might this have for admiralty cases, which actually Congress sort of carved out of um, uh, 1390. Um, uh, but there are other specialized venue, venue statutes, too, that, that use that definition of residence. And um, if it doesn't apply um, uh, to 1400 me, maybe it doesn't apply to those other specialized venue statutes as well. Great. Um, well, I think we've hit time, and I want to thank you for your attention. Could you please thank our panelists for giving us their time and thought? Please join us for a reception and further conversation. And uh, thanks for thanks having for a long day. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's so important. Yeah. Mistakes are big. Yeah, you as well. Yeah. What, what did you uh, click? As I work? said, it, the, uh, the KSR said, if, if this is the biggest patent case since 1966, that, 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 that just shows how far the federal state is straight. That's just a measure of the federal service. Yeah. Insurrection. Yeah. Like, so much to take that. Although my daughter is a caller. Don't do that. Two sisters. It was well in time. In fact, they did. So we're probably being videotaped. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about uh, your family. family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, we have a gift for you as well. Oh, really? Really? Uh, uh, it's I think it's a key. I don't even That's remember what it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to. I think it's going to be a split. Oh, no, it looks like no, a charger. Oh, no, no, that's good. Uh, uh, try to make it useful. Yeah, no, I thought it was. It's always useful. Uh, uh, kind of have to run. Okay. But, uh, so, um, so what do you teach? Well, well I'm mostly, uh, I'm mostly uh, some uh, type of thing. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Slides. So he's uh, yeah. 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 a poor half of his time. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
You're going to pass that. I'm just going to get a drink at you. Then I feel like most of their litigation power is more spicy than fast food. Yeah. That has been successful. Yeah. 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 It's not yeah. so yeah. 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 So that, that's a good way to keep it on the Well, I mean, U.S. ICE is just like the 740th so time at the time. They're already saying it's uh, oh, really bad. Yeah, they're delayed. <laughs> so uh, I'd say Delaware has a lot of other than Pat, they don't want. I don't know how to do that. So they all love their <laughs> plan. Plan. Um, but I'd like to see. Start now. Maybe you said you pray for like Congress. Congress is like. This can be our so because I thought I could go first and so talk about there should be one thing so it's really just that one go along Oh, uh, you guys need any help? Yeah, I don't right now. Right now, I have a lot of slides for the idea is that they're the same thing with the model periods. I'm just, they're doing animation of the show in 1970 and 2015. Um, as of now, there's not a whole lot of it. So, I'll tell you where the plan is. Oh, we can. Um, I figured for this, I'd focus on the trend of openness. I'll be around in Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh. So this is, we have one more. We, have, uh, we can do, you know, whether or not countries have a flexibility test. But, no. I think we have to actually go carefully look at all the answers because it's one thing if it's a, you know, there's opening I mean, tests and there's closing tests. I mean, can they do like a Google spreadsheet like what we got the question the and just kind of see like where they're interested in. Or if it's like, and then maybe we can there's an education huh? thing that's only available for printed works and it's only available I'm good at logistics. Then they have that I can help with that. Kind of uh, yeah. That's yeah. yeah. Telling no, me. they I would say I subject to the balance. I think something needs to happen. Like this is the thing. Alyssa. Yeah. Oh. Oh. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced this is what we need to do. It is fix the bad system. But I think this no. is going to be it's, well, it's an important uh, thing. Destroying the monopoly. So I, yes. I so where we're going to well, let me know. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, school, so the whole like, be nice. multiple people, be people who think they have good say, ideas. So you, you file yeah, with that's this place of business. Maybe I'll help. Uh, yeah. so, or, no, knock it off. That's uh, a way. Like a facility. Like you were saying about Amazon. Openness gives you a dimension. That would be great too. But just saying, anywhere you have personal jurisdiction, basically everywhere. Specifically, say you can do so that's that's a problem. Right. So, choose and most likely to choose the ability is something different to me. It's does okay, your thanks. I does agree. Your courts, does your law require courts to do some kind of uh, case uh, by case? Uh, so uh, uh, that to me is more of a yeah. sense of like. Uh, yeah. Say other uh, courts can't do it, but uh, I, so I want to be able to point to actually, it's actually everybody has to do it. Like, like the number I would love to have that that's like completely of the over our heads. You know, if they're looking at something that's very narrow, and maybe we've all read one case on it, like how long should we really be? I think they'll also cross that to tell it finally. I think that they're going to have to understand as practitioners yeah, that the yeah, reading only wow. goes so far. So it's just far. Far. It's more than that. They so might have to I be just, like, look, this is what we're getting at. Oh, obviously, where you have and something we could expand the flexibility. Uh, I'm not sure that things we can totally do to get rid of. I think so too. Yeah. I just hope that they understand when they're working yeah, with well, students that they can't expect. Well, not too much. I mean, I think it's just like. I think we've all worked with people that didn't quite understand where students were. So like, it's fine. You can bring us up to the level of understanding. Especially those of us that are here. 
where it's that about the intricacies of patent when I'm like just to, now to sue and, and but I mean I and think and it's fine part part to tell me things but you're gonna have to do that parties liable what I mean from that area you should also like this paper be liable in essence for for it's really uh, focusing uh, on the four factor game. test. So, so I let's well, just hope I get that. Like, they should have uh, uh, <laughs> <to, laughs> uh, 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 even though they are gaining. Okay, Apple from the artist artist that are being sold. Thank you for rhetoric. They gave us a trademark case. I know it's different. Rhetoric. They gave us a trademark case, and all of us that are interested. Yeah, so basically, we got a. This isn't real. Like we've already done the research. We've got a meeting with ten. I've got a meeting with eleven. And then we weren't allowed to address some of these. Maybe we would have had to like do all these things. We would definitely yeah, like have to do like, so, like none of us would ever want to use it as a writing sample, regardless yeah. of how good our writing is. <laughs> 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 I mean, Alan honestly uh, was one of the easier ones to do. I have a couple of questions, but he decided his stuff well. He did the whole years. So it's like. There are some people that if I, I don't sit down with them, it would be a long run out. This isn't going to be one of those. Okay, well, that's good. All right, let's play it by your hands. Yeah. Do you, do you agree with what you okay. like? Well, your point of view. Um, oh, oh, my my all of my writing samples have a, I was tasked with taking this position. Yeah. Um, good idea. <laughs> good idea. <laughs> well, I will ask you about it. Pretty general for corporations in general, so everyone should be subject to, to personal jurisdiction over there. So um, I, I see that argument. I just think the the impact it has on patent policy yeah and, and I read uh, I read the, the wired article actually somebody pointed out to me and they talked about the policy and I agree with that I was just kind of like in my head trying yeah. to nope. do nope. the devil's nope. advocate it's, it's part a, of it it's a great I mean the argument goes both ways because um, that's why it basically hasn't happened um, but uh, I think for Pat I mean the argument that, that this is the federal circuit trying not to be different is true the federal circuit has, has done just what they do in it what they do, we do in cases with corporations and antitrust and product liability. But I think this is an area where we need something specialized because patent cases are filed uniquely in Texas. And that's that's rare. And I think it's the only type of cases like that. And so when you have that situation, I think there's things we can do that are unique to patent law that make it uh, special. Well, thanks again. I yeah. enjoyed uh, listening now that. Uh very interesting. Like I said, I, I agree with the whole uh, issue with the taxes, and I read on it about how you know, it has detrimental effects on uh, services those corporations.